Welcome to Nebraskanomics, where we help Nebraskans remove barriers to opportunity with policy research and legislative advice. I'm your host, Jim Vocal, CEO of the Platt Institute, a Nebraska-based think tank promoting policies that make it easier to get a good job, start a business, and help Nebraskans keep more of what they earn. If you want more economic freedom in Nebraska, then let's get started. As we prepare for the new legislative session, Nebraska is facing a substantially changed landscape in the unicameral. There are 16 new state senators, nearly one in every three legislative seats. Add to that the transition in our governor's office and the wave of retirements of legislative employees who are responsible for the important behind the scenes work of the body. The unicameral is undergoing a great loss of historical knowledge and experience and beginning a period of change. Today on Nebraskanomics, I'm going to turn over the mic to three of our staff members who are former Nebraska state senators. Jim Smith, our chief strategy officer, Dr. Laura Epke, our senior fellow, and Nicole Fox, our director of government relations, so they can share their insights on what is happening in the lead up to a new session that may not be obvious to the average Nebraskan. I hope you enjoy their conversation. This podcast was recorded in the weeks leading up to the start of the 108th Nebraska legislature. But as we know, much of what happens in the weeks leading up to the first session of the two-year legislature will serve as an important foundation. Today, we will highlight key activities leading up to the start of session and those that occur in the first few weeks of session. I'm Nicole Fox, Director of Government Relations, and I'm the chief liaison between the Platt Institute and the legislature. I served in the legislature during the 2016 session. I'm joined on the podcast today by Laura Ebke, Senior Fellow at the Platt Institute, and Jim Smith, our Chief Strategy Officer. Both Laura and Jim served in the legislature, and I'll let them tell their stories a little later in the podcast. As many know, the 108th legislature begins with the 90-day first session in 2023. 2024 will be the short 60-day session of the 108th legislature and will mostly serve as a continuation of the first session. For example, The leadership elected and selected at the start of the 2023 first session will carry over to the 2024 second session. Unfinished business will carry over as well. So for example, bills that don't make it across the finish line. Therefore, what happened at the start of the first session is extremely important. Let's start by talking about leadership and committee assignments and how it all begins. So Jim, can you tell us about your history in the legislature and what you see as important activities leading up to the start of session. Thanks, Nicole. I served in the legislature from 2011 to 2018. My standing committee assignments during that time included Natural Resources Committee, Business and Labor, Urban Affairs, Transportation and Telecommunications, and Revenue. I served as chair of Transportation and Telecommunications Committee and the Revenue Committee And then also I served as the vice chair of the Committee on Committees Select Committee. A lot of committees there. The latter, uh, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But much of the significant decisions made in the first day of session is based on activities uh, that occur late in the year leading up to session, just as uh, Nicole mentioned. Of course, for background, our 49 state senators are traditionally grouped according to the three congressional districts, Congressional District 1, which is centered in Lincoln, Congressional District 2 in Omaha, and the third Congressional District, which includes Greater Nebraska. And of course, as those groupings occur, both the second district and the third district will each have 16 senators as part of that group. The first legislative district or the first congressional district, I should say, is the one that will have 17 senators as part of it. Senators within each group will caucus prior to the start of the first session of the legislature. And remember, as Nicole mentioned, the first session of the 108th legislature is 2023. It will be 90 days. And those additional days allow for that setup of, of activities. The caucusing that takes place in each of the three congressional districts ahead of session is primarily for the purpose of allowing senators from within the caucus to express their committee interests and for the caucus to determine which four senators from their respective groups will sit on a very important committee on committee select committee. 
and which two senators from each of those caucus will be part of the exec board, the executive board, again, from each of the respective groups. On the first day of session, following election of the speaker, standing committee chairs, and chairs of the executive board and committee on committees, the committee on committees, which now will be made up of 12 plus that chair, will assemble to make committee assignments. It's the role of the committee on committee members on that first day to distribute assignments as fairly as possible so that each area of the state has representation on that respective committee. Once each committee is determined, the committee will meet to then elect its vice chair. And of course, all of those decisions that are made by the committee on committees on assignment will basically be ratified by the full legislature on one of the days following that first day. Laura, tell us about your history in the legislature and your experience with the caucusing activities. Sure. Well, I spent four years in the legislature, 2015 through the 2018 session, and then left in January of 2019. The caucuses were something that were a little bit foreign to me when I first came in. Didn't really understand what they were going to do. In my class, there were a fair number of us who were from the third congressional district who were brand new. And I think we were all pretty clueless at the time. Fortunately, there were a couple of people who knew what was going on and they called the caucus together because we're from the third district and there's people that come from as far away as Scotts Bluff and points west. We met right before the session started, I think the day before, maybe on that Tuesday to kind of hash things out. We had exchanged some emails and such. But as Jim mentioned, what you do is we sat down with a piece of paper and listed our preferences. We decided who was going to be the committee assignments. We decided who was going to be our reps on the committee on committees and the exec board. So I think all the caucuses do things ex essentially the same way, but it probably depends a little bit on who the senior members are of the caucus who call folks together. Now, Laura, could you tell us a little bit about the first day of session and talk about how that starts out? Yeah, the first day of session is pretty exciting. It gets right down to it. That's family day. You get to bring your family in, take pictures. When I entered in 2015, all three of my kids were there and my husband came and sat on the floor with me for a little while and they got lots of pictures taken in front of the bill. It was a great Christmas card that year. So uh, you have a lot of senators who bring families on and then everybody just wandering around trying to figure out what they do next. They have the swearing in of the new senators. You have clerk who and temporary officers who conduct the swearing in as chief justice comes in and swears y'all in. And then you get down to business and the guests leave or go up into the gallery. And then the senators get to work electing the officers of the legislature, which includes the speaker and the, the clerk and the sergeant at arms. And then you start electing committee chairs and, you know, get down to get down to business. 90 days, you don't have a lot of time to piddle around on these things. So, Jim, yes, they, they start out with electing the speaker, and then what? Well, after the speaker, the most important thing, of course, is electing leadership of each of the committees. So the committee is take place on an alphabetical order. So I believe agriculture is the first committee, and then we move right on down. I think the last one for elections will be urban affairs. And those are the standing committees, and just to be mindful of, that there are select committees of the executive board and the committee on committees, although they are not standing committees, leadership will be selected on that first day for a couple of those select committees or special committees. And then there are rules committees and others that will take place as well. But I think the thing that most folks look for closely on that first day are the election of chairs for those committees. And now that we've talked a lot about leadership assignments and how the committee makeup comes about, Laura, do you want to talk about committee staff? Sure. And it depends on the committee. Some committees have staff that just stay with the committee forever, right? Or have been there for a long time. The banking committee recently lost their committee council. Revenue committee, I think, has lost a couple of staff members as well. When I came in as committee chair, the judiciary committee, both of the legal council had left, as had the committee clerk, <laughs> right before I, um, at the end of the session. And so anticipating that I might be elected committee chair, I went ahead and hired a couple of people on the contingency because you never know until that first day 
whether or not you're actually going to have the job and if there's a contested election. And I think in the areas where there typically is a contested election, that's where you get the permanent staff that sticks around because it would not be good to have bills start being introduced and not have committee staff figured out yet. But yeah, I mean, committee staff does a lot of work. Some committees only have one and a half extra persons, usually a committee counselor a research assistant and a clerk. In some cases, for some of those intense committees, less busy committees, they share the administrative assistant and the committee clerk do double duty. I know we've talked a lot about the leadership and the caucusing, committee makeup, but it's kind of interesting. I remember during my time in the legislature, where you sat in the legislature and where your office was located. Those were pretty big deals. Jim, do you want to explain the office assignment process? Sure. And just before I jump into that, I just wanted to build off of something that Laura said just quickly on staff in the legislature, how critical it is for the state of Nebraska to have legislative staff with experience in retaining those folks because the term limits for our legislators is tremendously important for those legislators coming into office to have some continuity from their predecessor. And so that staff can offer that continuity. And of course, every member of the legislature is allowed to staff the 8A administrative assistant to answer the phone and take care of keeping the office running smoothly and the legislative aide. And that is the person that's going to help that senator, whether they're a brand new senator or an experienced senator, help them put that legislation together, to put the agenda together. And then as Laura said, in the leadership capacity of some of these uh, offices, they will have additional staff to help them function for the committee itself. But uh, of course, office assignment, seat assignment is always on everyone's mind. And I may have a little bit of a t different take on this. You know, at one time, uh, some senators had to share an office. That This was before there were enough offices in the legislature for everyone to have their own office. And so it was probably more important at that time to try to be in a position to have your own office, to have your own privacy. As a new senator, and there were going to be, I think, four to six, I think it's maybe only four senators, but if I came in in 2011, that had to share offices. And I intentionally moved to share an office for my first two years. It was part of that relationship building. And I think it's not so much for me, it was not a matter of office location and seat location as much as it was that relationship building. So. Of course, committee chairs have assigned committee offices. The revenue committee always has the same office. Judiciary committee has the same office. So once we get all of the chairs elected, we know who's going to fill those particular offices. So once dust settles and we know those committee chairs, then remaining office space follows seniority. With term limits, there's some equal seniority out there. And when that occurs, we draw straws to see who gets to choose the office. I, once again, I know some people get really hung up on that office location. And I would say it's more of a convenience than a necessity to have certain offices. Then there's also the assignment of seating on the floor of the legislature itself, which again, follows seniority and drawing of straws. There's really, in my opinion, no great or bad seed on the floor of the legislature. We're all very thankful to be an elected office holder and to have a seat at all. Some people want to be on the aisle so they can work the room a little bit easier. Some prefer to be near the back of the room. Some people want to be near the side so they can have easy access back and forth in and out of the chamber. For me personally, I prefer the back of the chamber so that I can observe the interactions, not all the way to the back, but further to the back where I can observe that. Something that will be interesting for the casual observer to note is that the speaker of the legislature does the exact same thing. So if the speaker of the legislature had a seat near the front before they were the speaker, they may choose to keep that same seat. The only distinguishing feature with their seat is on their name plate, 
they have an additional nameplate that says speaker. They can choose to be anywhere on the floor that they want to be. Of course, when they are sitting as the presiding officer of the legislature, they're out of their seat. They're up in the front of the chamber. But that's kind of in a nutshell, a little bit of a different take on it. I don't know if there's any great seats, any bad seats. It's kind of a personal preference and may just come down to convenience. Laura, anything you'd like to add? Well, yeah, I had my preference. My preference was at the front. You and I sat next to each other in 2016 and down at the front. I think I ended up there by default my first year, and I always kind of liked it up there because I could watch what was happening up on the dais. You could see who was getting ready to drop a bill or who was ready to drop an amendment, and you could see the frustration in the clerk's eyes when he saw more amendments showing up or whatever. So that was kind of my favorite place to be. When I became a committee chair two years later, I still wanted to stay up as close as I could to the front. I think I was about three rows back, but I moved over to the edge and that was at the clerk's recommendation because he said, you're going to be judiciary chair and you want to be close to the edge so your legal counsel can come and talk to you. And I said, oh, okay. So he moved me, but it made a lot of sense because it was easier for the legal counsel to come and talk to me. But I still like being up to the front so that I could see what was happening at the front of the chamber. But again, you could do it from the back. And there were lots of things that I think probably went on in the back that those of us up front didn't see. Well, Laura, I will say I appreciated your mentorship in the time that I sat next to you up in the front row. So now that we talked about some of the different things going on in the background, getting ready for session and the first day of session. I'd like to talk about the first 10 days in general, and that is the bill introduction process. But to step back just a tad bit, like legislative leadership and committee assignments, there is activity going on in the weeks, actually the months and weeks leading up to session. In fact, today I spent some time looking at a few bill drafts that will hopefully get dropped on one of those first couple of days of session. So formal bill introduction does occur days one through 10 of session. And what that means is that the final drafts of the bills are filed by senators with the clerk of the legislature. And then as those are filed, the clerk reads the title of the bill into the record and then assigns it a bill number. So then after that occurs, bills are reviewed by members of the executive board and then they're referred to the appropriate committee of jurisdictions. For example, if there's a tax bill that's being introduced, it'll get referred then to the revenue committee. So senators can introduce as many bills as they like, and some will introduce maybe five or 10 bills, but there's some that have been known to introduce 30, 40. I think last year, maybe somebody had as many as 50. The committees can also introduce bills and they each get the opportunity to introduce up to eight. So in a single session, when you think about all the senators and then all the committee bills, it's not uncommon to see at least six, seven hundred total bills introduced. Now, some of the bills that are being introduced, they might be a brand new proposal dealing with an issue that has come up over the course of the year. Uh, Some proposals are resulting from discussions that have been had about issues during previous legislative sessions. For example, we'll likely see proposals to reduce property tax burdens and adjust how we fund public K-12 education. It's subject matter that we've seen before, but with a new proposal as to how to address the issue. There will also be bills that will be brought back that were introduced previously. These are bills that maybe had some board momentum, but it just didn't make it across the finish line due to some time constraints. And that definitely happened to a lot of bills that got out of committee last year. And then we'll see some recycled bills that may have been introduced before, but never really gained much traction. So in those first 10 days of session, Laura and I are very busy reading through all of those bills. And then we feel they're aligned with our organization's legislative priorities. And then we discuss them with the team to decide if we want to take a formal position on them. Given that we'll have 16 new senators and several new staff in the legislature due to retirements, I'm guessing that there could be a record number of bill introductions, which means we'll have a lot of reading to do here at the Platt Institute. Jim, Laura, tell me your thoughts. Is there anything I missed? Or do you want to give a guess as to how many bills you think will be introduced? Well, I don't know if I'd venture to guess how many bills, but there's probably not a lot of new ideas under the sun. And as Nicole mentioned, a lot of these are retreads that have been introduced before, maybe didn't get traction in a prior legislative session. And something kind of to take note of, uh, to your point, Nicole, 
newer senator is probably going to feel more compelled to introduce more legislation because they're fresh off the campaign trail. They just freshly heard from their constituents. And also they're not holding a leadership position. So they have a little bit more time to focus on volume. I'm not saying that's good or bad, but I know for myself, whenever I was a newer senator, I introduced more bills. It was always well under a dozen, dozen bills. But once I moved into leadership with transportation and telecommunications committee and revenue committee, I really focused more on that area of legislation. And so my personal individual bills that I would carry became fewer and fewer. So I think to your point, Nicole, because we do have a a sizable number of new senators coming in, fresh off the campaign trail, we likely will have an abundance of legislation dropped on that first number of days. I'll venture a guess. I think we'll have over 800 bills pretty easily, probably closer to 850. As we wrap up today, would either of you like to share a quick bit of advice for new senators? Well, I'll start. First thing is to enjoy the experience. You know, I'm certain for the new senators coming off the campaign trail, that was a great experience for them that they will take with them for the rest of their life. And uh, do the same with the first few days of your first legislative session. Just enjoy it. Work on those relationships. They will be relationships for life. I would echo everything that Jim just said. Enjoy the experience. Enjoy your time there. Try not to get too stressed out in those early days. Start looking at some of those senior senators who you can trust or who you can develop a relationship with and watch what they're doing. I mean, when I was a first year senator, I knew who Jim Smith was. And I always kept my eye on him because I always thought he had something cooking that I needed to know about. Whether you're there for four years or one year or eight years, that's a great experience and you'll never forget it. Laura, Jim, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a great conversation and I look forward to the start of session here in a few weeks. Thank you for tuning in today. It will be interesting to see if Laura's prediction of 800 bills introduced pans out. In closing, I want to encourage you to advocate for bills that are important to you and to take full advantage of the information and resources we make available on our website, platinstitute.org, and through our weekly email. Thank you for listening to today's episode. If you want more economic freedom in Nebraska, please visit platinstitute.org to make a donation to help fund our research and advocacy. Or you can subscribe to our newsletter and learn about today's most important issues facing Nebraskans. It's time to stop the status quo. Let's remove economic barriers and make Nebraskans proud.